Well, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's Prepared for Environmental Change webinar, in which we'll focus on using green space and vegetation as an adaptation strategy. My name is Andrea Webster. I'm the Implementation Manager here at the Environmental Resilience Institute at Indiana University, which is part of the Prepared for Environmental Change Grand Challenge Initiative. My job is to connect local governments in Indiana across the Midwest with resources that will help them prepare for climate change. So we're very happy to have all of you with us here today. A few logistics before we get started. Uh, we are recording today's webinar and a copy will be accessible on the ERI website within the next week or so. We will email it you once it becomes available. So everyone is muted and we ask that you save your questions until the end, but if you have an urgent question during a presentation, feel free to enter it into the chat box. And on your behalf, I will interrupt our, our pre presenters and ask that question. Now, to access the chat box, you can hover your mouse over the Zoom window and the chat function should appear or a button to uh, show you where the chat function is should appear. So with increasing precipitation that we're experiencing in the winter and spring, much of which occurs in heavier downpours, we need strategies to deal with all of that excess water. Purposefully placed green space and vegetation can do wonders towards that end. And I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers who can provide some insight on that topic. Dr. Heather Reynolds is an associate professor in the biology department at Indiana University. She's the co-leader of the Urban Green Infrastructure Working Group at the Environmental Resilience Institute. She'll be our first presenter today. And along with her team, Heather investigates the socioeconomics, policy, and ecology of designing, of designing urban green spaces for human health, food, and energy systems. Along with her today is Dr. Jeff Wilson. He will be on today's webinar and is available to answer questions. He's a professor of geography and is the Associate Dean for Research in the School of Liberal Arts at IUPUI, which is Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. His research interests include environmental applications of remote sensing and GIS technologies in urban environments, particularly in the context of health and well being. We also have Ms. Uh, Brenda Scott Henry with us today. She is the Director of Green Urbanism and Environmental Affairs at the city of Gary, Indiana. She has over 15 years of experience in environmental programs and services. She also serves as the stormwater coordinator and is primarily responsible for the planning and implementation of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permitted program. She directs the environmental, operational, and programmatic requirements for all water, land, and air quality protection projects and planning efforts. She also collaborates with city departments and organizations to increase municipal efficiency while maximizing sustainable impacts on the community. Uh, so that is your panel today. We're very honored to have those three um, very talented individuals providing some information to us today. Uh, and so with that, uh, we have a few announcements before we get started with our content. So first I wanna welcome uh, the variety of folks we have on the call today. We have a number of people from the state of Indiana and from across the Midwest and across the United States and even a few people from Canada. So welcome to all of you. And if it's your first time, we hope you enjoy it and we hope that you uh, tune in for future webinars. We have two webinar co-hosts. Uh, one is the uh, Association for Indiana Counties, which was established in 1957 for the betterment of county government. AIC represents the legislative needs of Indiana counties. Our second co-host is Accelerate Indiana Municipalities. So AIM is the official voice of municipal government in Indiana with more than 460 cities and towns as members. Here at the Environmental Resilience Institute, we are conducting a lot of research uh, and developing tools and solutions to help the Midwest and beyond prepare for environmental change and specifically prepare for climate change. So uh, just this past fall, we released the Environmental Resilience Institute Toolkit or ERIT. That is an online website, which is full of resources for local governments specifically in the Midwest. And we also are in the process of developing the Hoosier Resilience Index. And we are holding a webinar on that project in May. And so we hope that you'll register and attend 
uh, to see how that process is going and we and to provide feedback. We hope to launch that in the fall. All right, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna let Heather share her screen. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thanks for being here today. Let's see. There we go. Uh, let me start by acknowledging that I'm not a flood control expert, I'm an ecologist, but I'm working with Jeff and a number of other scholars to develop a GIS based platform for inventorying and mapping urban green infrastructure and associated social and economic variables and climate change risks. So this first slide is just to show sort of a concept of our vision. You see the central GIS layers um, in the middle. And the idea is that this will be a tool and a resource for cities to be able to analyze their green infrastructure, figure out where it's working well, where there are places where it needs to be strengthened so that they can better provide services like flood control. So we've been working a lot on the logistics of this platform. We've just started to think about how to use a platform like this for planning flood control green infrastructure and it'll be great to get feedback hopefully from the audience at the end about whether the kinds of planning issues and tools that we are uh, considering resonate with you as well as your specific data and planning needs. It would be great to get some insight on that. So with that sort of overall context and vision, let me start with a few introductory slides and then I wanna work through an example planning issue. So urban green infrastructure is broadly defined as networks of urban green spaces that are managed for their benefits or their e eco services. And as the images show, it can take many forms. Some examples shown going from left to right are bioswales, riparian corridors, food producing gardens, urban forest and park, and then green roofs all the way over on the right. And these spaces act as filtration systems that can purify our air and water. They provide shade and thermal cooling. They store carbon, provide pest control, produce fresh food, provide all kinds of recreational and ecotourism, education and cultural expression services. All of these things contribute to our quality of life. And of course, they also can provide flood control, which is the focus um, today. And images like this are of course all too frequent. We've all experienced uh, in Indiana at least um, a lot of water on the ground. Um, and this is happening of course because as and Andrea alluded at the beginning, our climate is changing. It's getting warmer as well as wetter. And these are just a few statistics from uh, the Indiana Climate Change Impact Assessment whose URL is listed at the bottom of the screen. And you can see, you know, we've already seen increases in precipitation of over five and a half inches over the last century, but this is projected to continue to increase. Um, and particularly winter and spring precipitation increasing by mid-century, 20 and 16%, more of this precipitation falling as rain instead of snow and more heavy downpours. And increased precipitation is gonna to contribute to at least two kinds of flooding, uh, riverine flooding and surface flooding. And riverine flooding happens when precipitation exceeds river capacity and water overflows river banks or levees onto floodplains. And this is gonna happen whether you're in rural or urban areas. 
And addressing riverine flooding with urban green infrastructure is a watershed, watershed scale challenge because as the white arrows over the landscape in this image show, the water flooding any given position on the floodplain has been collected from all of the watershed upstream of that position. Surface flooding, on the other hand, is when precipitation exceeds soil infiltration capacity, for example, as soils get covered over with impermeable surface like asphalt, um, or precipitation exceeds the engineered drainage capacity of storm drains that cities put in under their infrastructure. And this leads to ponding of rainwater at the surface, even outside of floodplains. So surface flooding is, of course, very common in urban areas due to the high density of impervious surface like roads, pavement, and buildings, which reduce soil infiltration. And it is much more of a local scale issue. Of course, we're also getting floodplain flooding in cities too because um, rivers and floodplains, uh, you know, cities are built in them as well. So urban green infrastructure reduces flooding by slowing, absorbing, and storing rainwater like a sponge. And common forms of urban green infrastructure, so particularly water holding uh, vegetation and soils, are going to include stormwater wetlands. You can see this beautiful constructed uh, wetland in front of the building at the upper left of the screen, rain gardens, bioswales, Urban forest, of course, um, provides a lot of water holding and evapotranspirative capacity. Green roofs and permeable, permeable pavers. So these are some of your more common forms of urban green infrastructure. So we have these wonderful forms. Um, and the question is, how much urban green infrastructure is needed and where? And the answer is gonna depend on multiple factors, including which type of flooding, riverine or surface flooding, you're dealing with. So I wanted to work through uh, an example um, to show some of the tools that, again, we envision coming from the kind of platform we're envisioning to help think about where and how much urban green infrastructure you need. And Andrea, let me know ever if I'm going too slow here. So um, this slide is titled Using GIS to Identify Vulnerable Areas and Populations. So it's showing a number of readily accessible GIS-based data sets that are available from national level sources so you can get watershed information from usgs impervious surface from mrlc socioeconomic status from in this case cdc and then floodplain information from fema so for example you can take a look at sub watersheds identify the sub watersheds in your municipality and this is um, showing the Marion County uh, area, so Indianapolis. We're focused here on Indianapolis as a case study. And you can overlay watersheds with impervious surface information to see where are the most vulnerable watersheds in your municipality. And so, for example, this uh, image on the right, um, you can see outlined in blue um, the Bean Creek Pleasant Run. This is actually the second highest, number two uh, impervious surface watershed in Marion County. And we decided to focus on it for today because it's a watershed that we are already um, doing a lot of uh, research in. Okay, so. We've identified a watershed that looks like it'd be especially um, vulnerable to flooding. And then we can take and use this socioeconomic status information, again, in this case from the Center for Disease Control, um, 
to get a sense of how vulnerable socioeconomically this watershed is. And this scale um, is actually the red, it would be the highest socioeconomic vulnerability in this case. Um, so um, poorer, uh, for example, census tracts. Uh, and you can see that there is quite a bit of orange and red, even yellow. Those are sort of the higher vulnerability um, areas. So again, these are just tools that we can bring together to help us think about where we might want to prioritize uh, urban green infrastructure given limited resources. And then we can also look at um, FEMA floodplain hazard potential. So what this slide is showing, you can see the legend, um, light blue, for example, is 100 year floodplain, the next darkest 500 year, whether it's levee protected or not, and floodways. Uh, so you can see the areas that are going to be vulnerable to riverine flooding in this waterway. Well, there, I'm gonna, a question came in through chat. On the oh, previous cool. slide, uh, could you define what you mean by socioeconomic vulnerability within the context? Yes, um, sorry about that. So this particular index is using four variables to get a sense of the socioeconomic vulnerability of the population. And the four variables going into this are percent below poverty level, percent unemployed, um, the income level, and the percent with no high school diploma. So thinking about vulnerable populations in terms of their resources available to deal with risks and stresses like flooding does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, so, um, so what one could do with GIS, of course, is zoom in all along the floodplain and actually identify uh, particular structures that are in the floodplain. Households figure out how, you know, who's, who's in that floodplain, who's at risk. And this is just one example, um, I'm circling this, this little area of the floodplain in red, because I'm going to zoom into it. This is actually an area of particularly low socioeconomic status too from the previous slide. And so you can just see the purple are the structures, homes and other buildings. And you can see just for this small section that there are a number of uh, people, structures uh, in, in the floodplain. Um, and obviously you could go all along the floodplain and, and see, um, identify these especially vulnerable um, buildings. Okay. So then the question is, so Jeff and I were thinking about this, okay, uh, in thinking about how to employ urban green infrastructure to help mitigate this kind of risk, especially as we're gonna be seeing more flooding with this you know, increased precipitation from climate change. But when you're dealing with riverine flooding, and this is something that Jeff was, was very good about pointing out to me, is you know, it's a watershed scale issue. So you're not going to just go in and put some urban green infrastructure around a, a given structure here in the floodplain and think you're gonna protect it from this flooding. Um, so just a thought um, process for how much UGI is enough when you're talking about mitigating riverine flooding. We did a little back of the envelope calculation for the, the Pleasant Run waterway. And so if you look at the table here, um, first question is, well, what is your target reduction in flood risk? Uh, you, need to, you need to have some target. So one way to think about that is Think about, okay, of the 100 year flood peak discharge, you wanna mitigate a certain percentage of that peak discharge or peak discharge being the maximum volume of water that's coming through 
um, at the peak of a hundred year flood. And so uh, over on the right, you can see the resources um, where you can get this type of information for Indiana, for example. Uh, every state will have its own um, resources. But so ballpark answer, let's just say we wanted to mitigate 1% of a hundred year flood peak discharge. If you look up what that peak discharge is for a position fairly low in the watershed of Pleasant Run, um, you get that's 4430 cubic feet per second of water. So if you want to mitigate that 1%, you need to uh, find a way to store 44.3 cubic feet per second of water. Okay, so that helps set a target. Um, second question then, how much storage capacity is required to meet that target? Okay, so cubic foot per second, when you're dealing with storage capacity, you need to convert to acre feet per day. And there are various online hydrology converters that can help you do this. Um, if we do this conversion, you get, okay, what you need to store is 87.8 acre foot of water per day. And I converted that back to cubic feet. Um, and you'll see why in a moment. Because then, okay, so it helps to think about the scale then. You're looking for 87.8 acres that can hold a foot of water in order to mitigate that, you know, 1% of that 100 year flood peak discharge. So it really speaks to how um, it, it is a watershed scale problem and how we really need to think seriously about incorporating urban green infrastructure into our development as we go. Um, so capital costs then to get some idea, and this is just capital costs, okay? So just the materials. Um, the, NOAA has a lot of great flood control resources and, and one of them that we found is listed on the right here. It provided some estimates of capital costs for different forms of UGI. Um, so stormwater wetlands, for example, relatively inexpensive at one to two dollars per cubic foot of storage. And so on for other forms gets very expensive when you're talking about uh, green roofs, for example, could, could become quite high. So anyway, to get a sense of the dollars you'd be talking about, you know, these are in cubic dollars per cubic foot. You can multiply by the, the, this number, um, you know, 3.8 million cubic foot to get a sense of the, the dollars that you'd be talking about. Um, not to, um, you know, present a discouraging picture, but a one to sort of spark us to um, be thinking about planning in urban green infrastructure as we develop. Um, just quickly, because I realize I'm pretty much at the end of my, I'm over my 15 minutes, so quickly. Surface flooding, of course, permits more local UGI solutions. Um, and so on the screen, you can see to the left, this is just an example from Indianapolis of a surface flooding hotspot. Um, that was successfully mitigated with, um, this looks like a bioretention um, feature. Um, it, it also, it is going to a drain. Um, so depending on which type of flood risk you wanna mitigate, you need to be thinking watershed scale or you can be thinking uh, more locally. And I think that was where I wanted to leave it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Heather. It's certainly nice to start to understand the difference between riverine flooding and what surface flooding is and how green infrastructure can impact that. And so what I understood is that it seems like we need to have green infrastructure, you know, up the hill, up the watershed. So that's retaining water during these heavy storms. So it doesn't actually make it to the river right away, which then reduces riverine flooding. Is that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the more green infrastructure across the city generally is not only going to help reduce the surface flooding, but also help reduce riverine flooding too. So yeah. it's a really great lesson. Um, so next we're going to, I'm going to um, ask Heather to stop sharing her screen.
And then I'll start sharing mine uh, and we'll pass it over to Brenda here shortly. All right, so uh, we're very happy to have Brenda Scott Henry with us here today. Uh, so she's from the city of Gary, as I mentioned before, uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing about the projects going on in Gary. So uh, with that, Brenda, I'll pass it over to you. We can't hear you, Brenda. Thank you, Andrea. Sure, it looks so, like um, welcome, and thank you for this opportunity to share the work that we are doing here in Gary, Indiana. Um, to uh, can you see my screen yet, Andrea? Not yet. Thank you, Miriam. Miriam is going to help me out a little bit here. Okay. <laughs> so on this screen here. Can I share my screen? Are you sharing your screen? Yep, we can see your screen now. Okay, pull up the right PowerPoint. Is that okay? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. So, uh, thank you for this opportunity to share the work that we're doing here in Gary, Indiana, with you today. It's invigorating, really, to know that uh, many cities, towns, and uh, communities, rural communities are, have a uh, begun to prioritize the use of green infrastructure um, as a means for uh, climate adaptation strategies. Uh, today I will share with you a brief overview about the city uh, natural assets, uh, challenges that lead to, that led Team Gary and to incorporate sustainable development practices into revitalization strategies, uh, some of our planning efforts, and more specifically, uh, a component of our green infrastructure plan that is going on right now and the GIS tool. So here are pictures of our lakefront, Marquette Beach, uh, is on the shores of Lake Michigan. So some of the challenges, um, the city of Gary is using green infrastructure in a multifaceted approach to sustainably repurpose land and address water quality issues like stormwater runoff and flooding to, to uh, we're also looking at cons the conservation and preservation areas, land protected areas, and to uh, stabilize the neighborhoods that were impacted by the housing crisis. So we have a high level of vacancy here in the city of Gary, which also presents a unique opportunity for us to implement green infrastructure from lot sizes to maybe even acres of land that we can uh, manage stormwater. Green infrastructure is also used as a catalyst for um, uh, reigniting the public, reigniting our public to um, uh, engage in the processes. So for years of disinvestment, residents have kind of lost faith in the city processes. So using these neighborhood scale projects, green infrastructure projects has uh, ignited communities like Aetna to now um, be engaged uh, show stewardship and um, uh, improve their 
uh, improve their neighborhoods by being in, engaged. And most importantly, have a, a nat, uh, an appreciation for the natural landscape that we have. On the next slide, I'll talk about the, the, the challenges that we faced in terms of that led us to this process and toward building a resilient community. And this is neighborhood by neighborhood. We have a citywide, and we've completed citywide and neighborhood scale planning. Uh, we have an actively uh, civic engagement and public engagement process. And this is primarily due to the requirements of our stormwater permit, our NEPRDs permit to uh, do public education and outreach and public involvement and participation. As we do the, um, this work, we're planning to change the economy for the city of Gary. Right now, we are definitely an industrialized community, but the vacancy, the high level of vacancy that we have, land vacancy we have, creates a unique opportunity to ignite our economy, green economy. At the same time, it always would also allow us to focus on workforce development opportunities. So we are doing programs like uh, urban conservation, uh, urban agriculture, farming activities, and uh, other similar landscaping um, uh, maintenance work so that we can um, help our citizens uh, have access to uh, employment or entrepreneurship opportunities. Uh, we also have, um, based upon our experience in working with green infrastructure, doing a, um, a plethora of demonstration projects, we can now offer support to those who are in our community, as well as those who are interested in coming into our community to do the work. Um, and then most importantly, it will uh, improve our environment and public health. Um, we worked on a project some time ago with the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Citizen Initiative to uh, do some climate resiliency or climate app that will lead uh, assessment that will lead to uh, climate adaptation activities that we could implement. And it, it was, some of the mapping work that was done by um, the group show that we are having increased weather events, particularly in the Northwest Indiana area, uh, and that our, um, uh, and it's shown by the increase of the 1.2 to 1.5 days of wet weather events that has, we've increased to one, about 1.5, um, uh, okay. Well, wet weather events are increasing in the city of Gary. And this is actually uh, um, illustrated by the, the weather patterns that we are having, we've experienced just this at the beginning of this year with, uh, and last year, we had flooding last year. We had a tremendous flood in 2008 that really impacted the economy and some community, some areas, some of the towns around in the Northwest Indiana area have yet to recover from the flooding events that we had. So, um, which lead to uh, us to talk about some of these planning, green planning and demonstration projects that we've done in the city. So under the stormwater management plans, some of the stormwater management plans that we've done is the uh, stormwater quality management plan, which is a part of our NEPIDES permit. And we're looking in uh, 2020 to start doing a stormwater master plan that will consist of watershed plans, land use plans, our long-term control plan for a combined sewer, uh, and then green infrastructure plan that I'll talk about in detail a little bit later. But we've completed the watershed plan uh, in 2008 for the Little Calumet River Western Branch. Uh, we've completed the Green Link plan, which is a multimodal trail that connects 30 miles of green space and that encircles the city. And I'll show you a, um, a map of that later on in my presentation. We completed a, a local food, local places action plan, which uh, will help to activate our urban agriculture program. We have over 30 
um, uh, farming or community garden groups that are in the city of Gary that are doing things from farming to farmers markets to uh, prepared food that we are uh, placing in restaurants and utilizing uh, throughout the community. And then we have a this land uh, green infrastructure land use plan that is in the progress. We should finish this spring. And it's being done by our redevelopment commission uh, and planning and re planning department um, to help us to prioritize how we will do green infrastructure in the city based on certain criteria. Some of the model projects, and I have a slide following that will show, will, will link you to some resources to give you more in depth information about the projects that we've done. But uh, projects like Vacant to Vibrant and uh, Greater Green were used to stabilize the neighborhoods as well as repurpose uh, brownfields or just uh, impervious surfaces, large scale impervious surfaces, like the Sheraton Hotel that we demolished. Um, then we have a, uh, I talked a little bit about the climate resilience tool that we have that is now uh, an adaptation model that you can use to assess your uh, adaptation assessment that you can use in any community and that is available in the NOAA toolkit. And then we are currently working on an integrated water um, infrastructure toolkit that we can utilize uh, that our water, wastewater, stormwater, and drinking water utilities can work collaboratively to save on uh, resources, reduce costs, and improve uh, communication among the three utilities. Um, we are also working on a green, green workforce um, plan, um, given that we have uh, the long-term control plan in the progress and we have to do this work, it makes sense for us to make sure that we invest in our local residents and businesses to make sure that they capitalize on the investment Gary will make to do mitigation work. And then um, there's also a link to this, um, to the Sheraton site. We, re we are greening up that space. Uh, there's a rain garden at City Hall where uh, we're partnered with um, uh, USGS to do the stormwater monitoring on the site. And that's a three-year project where they will monitor the amount of stormwater that will not enter into our combined sewer. And we will continue to use this model to quantify water reduction from going into the combined sewer as a part of our um, greening effort. Mm. Um, so, to talk about the green infrastructure planning process that we have, this is a grant that we, uh, the planning and redevelopment received from uh, the Lake Michigan Coastal Program, funded by NOAA. Uh, but the process that we went through in order to, um, to reach our deliverables was stakeholder engagement. We had an advisory group. We had several uh, public meetings to just um, collect information and uh, identify resources that we could tap into or to make sure that we were including everybody in the process. Uh, under that data collection process, we looked at all plans that we had, existing plans we had, codes, uh, ordinances uh, that guided this work. We, um, that the information that we gathered, it was migrated into this information system that was developed by Dynamo Metrics and the redevelopment department also. Um, oh, let me go back. On the stakeholder engagement piece, we work collaboratively with the Delta Institute and also with uh, the, great, uh, the Alliance for the Great Lakes in order to do this work. It was a great experience. Um, but underneath the data collection and GIS um, process, we uh, ended up being a, um, a mapping tool or modeling tool that we have now. And I'll show you some examples of what that tool can do for us in terms of prioritizing and identifying spaces to or land to do green infrastructure projects. I've already talked about the demonstration projects that we did, but that was also a part of our green infrastructure planning process 
you know, you learn from experience and we use those experiences to help guide how this tool will work for us. Um, and at the end here, there was a policy scan that was completed. I mentioned that, that uh, but it helped us to also identify financial resources that we could tap into in order to do some implementation projects. Who was doing what and what got it our, uh, directed our, our work. And the next slide, which is stop up here. Um, so here's an example of the, oh, here, here we go. So uh, the tool, that the GIS tool that we uh, have is called the Gary Green Infrastructure Tool, uh, GIT, and uh, it allows us to do modeling, uh, suitability analysis. Uh, we have things like a green infrastructure framework to guide to prioritize project areas that we will focus on. And these maps were provided to us by the Delta Institute. So here's an example of the Green Link. So the Green Link is that 30 mile multimodal trail that we have um, uh, plans for in the city. And it consists of trails, our natural assets and conservation or preservation areas that are being managed by city partners like the Sherla Hines uh, Land Trust, uh, the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Indiana Dune National Lakeshore and other organizations. We also have uh, um, a map of the neighborhood stabilization. So the blue area will identify um, high levels of vacancy where we can uh, concentrate green infrastructure. If you layer, we also have a map, uh, a layer of um, uh, storm water focus area that aligns with our uh, NEPIDES permit. So we have MS4 areas that have storm drains that discharge directly into the water bodies. <clears throat> so this map, uh, if you layer that um, the MS4 focus areas with this neighborhood stabilization area, it helps us to identify where we can uh, prioritize, implement, stabilize neighborhoods in various uh, areas. So we have Glen Park is one of our MS4 areas. Small Farm in Tolleson is one. Uh, we also have some that are located in the uh, on the west side and as well as on the in the Miller community. How am I on time, Andrea? Uh, maybe uh, maybe two or three more minutes. Okay, good. I'm gonna have to and then this is also a map that illustrates our industrial areas. Gary is a highly industrialized community, then so because of the U.S. Steel and, and the subsidiary businesses that surround it. But it here illustrates those focus areas. And then here's a combination of uh, the green infrastructure framework mapping that connects the industrialized areas, the cor the green corridors, which are the the yellow lines on major thoroughfares in the city, the green link itself, parks, and, they, and then uh, our focus, the blue area, the, the map of the uh, neighborhood stabilization, and so much more. Um, and then finally, <laughs> here we have a, um, these are, these numbers illustrate proposed areas where we can do green infrastructure installation, and there's a whole laundry list <laughs> uh, lots of work for us to do in terms of doing the installation of these spaces. But then there are all, there's also a map that shows work that we've already done. And uh, I didn't want to include all of that information into this one presentation because I only have 15 minutes. Uh, then at the end here, I have a, a list of resources. One of the great tools we have is this uh, online, and you can connect to it, is the, is the parcel count. Uh, that was done uh, with the University of Chicago and a lot of partners and uh, Team Gary members. That was that's what we call them now. But if you go to that website, it will show you 
uh, the inventory of all parcels that we have in the city of Geary. So every residential parcel has been uh, assessed. We have photos. You can see whether it's vacant or there's a structure on there on the site. Uh, then um, uh, the condition of that property, uh, ranging from good to um, dangerous. And then we have, so that's an interesting tool for us. It really helps in terms of people understanding what Gary looks like. Um, then there's also the Chris model, I, as I mentioned, that tool is available to you. Vacant to Vibrant was a unique project that was funded by the Great Lakes Protection Fund. There's so much information online. All you have to do is type in Vacant to Vibrant. Um, uh, the Cleveland Botanical Garden did a great job in terms of doing this project. Um, we have a a stormwater management community engagement framework that will help communities to make sure that they engage citizens in the process or stakeholders in the process of developing this. And please take a moment to go to our GIS, the, to the USGS link where you will see a time lapse video of the rain garden that we did at City Hall. And then there's other resources available to you too. I want to thank all of our partners that are listed here, and uh, Andrea and other my colleagues. Thank you for this opportunity to share information about what we're doing here in Gary. Well, thank you so much, Brenda. And I want to tell everybody listening on the webinar today that Brenda shared a lot of resources, and so did Heather on a few of her slides. And I'll make sure to send those out later today, uh, so you can uh, explore them on your own without having to write down everything uh, that was said today. So we had, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen here again. And while I'm doing that, I just want to remind you that we have several webinars coming up over the next month. We have one per month. It's always the second Wednesday of the month from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern. So I hope that you will uh, register for those. And I'm going to go ahead and move right into questions because we had a number come in. Uh, one that came in. Uh, is that there, um, sorry, my chat box disappeared here. Uh, so one question for you, Brenda, is how much of the proposed reinfrastructure plan targets private property versus public lands in the right of way? Um, most of it is focused on uh, public owned land. Um, we all, there was a, um, the Redevelopment Commission and the Planning Zoning Commission worked collaboratively to identify, um, to put together this green infrastructure um, plan for zoning. So if commercial businesses uh, are moving to the area, then there's an opportunity for you to install green infrastructure as you're doing your redevelopment project. So but primarily we're focused on uh, public areas and we hope to eventually migrate into some private properties where we are encouraging uh, everyone to do green installation. Okay. And another question that came in for you, Brenda, was if the stabilization work includes buying up vacant lots for strategic redevelopment. Repeat that. What's the question? So the stabilization work you mentioned, does that include um, vacant lot buyouts to strategically redevelop, re redevelop them into green infrastructure or something else? Yes. So we would like to, um, so in order to do demolition on really blighted property, uh, we have to acquire the property. And this is a grant that we received from uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury under hardest hit fund, um, you have to have possession of the property. So we have almost uh, close to about $10 million with, that we are using to do demolition on those sites. Um, the purpose, the goal is to not have an inventory of properties, but to find um, reuses for those spaces, whether we're working with doing urban ag or individuals are doing side lot projects uh, uh, to acquire that property. Neighbors can acquire it to expand the space in which they're living in. Um, uh, sales, 
So there's a different, uh, there are different strategies uh, that are, uh, we're looking at in order to repurpose those vacant land, vacant parcels. There are over, um, I don't know, the number changes from time to time, but there are about, there were initially about 7,000 vacant properties that are, that are in the city. Uh, geez, it's a lot of, it's enormous. Well, no, we don't want to have it, possession of it. We want to re put them back on a the tax roll. <laughs> well, I certainly appreciate you highlighting the different benefits of green infrastructure in terms of light alleviation and stormwater management and all the other services that they provide. Uh, so another question that came in, I believe this one is for Heather and Jeff. So can you explain the relationship between poverty and likelihood of being flooded? Is there a general proven correlation between poverty and people living in the in a flood prone area? Jeff, do you want to answer that or would you like me to take it? Sure, I could I could speak a little bit to in the context of what we showed on our slides. Um, just to back up a minute, we're looking at a number of different socioeconomic and vulnerability indices. Um, what we tried to show on our slide is that there are floodplains and then there are vulnerable areas within that flood floodplains. The data source that we used, we, we purposely chose to select from nationally available data sources. So we used an example that's available. You can download it right now from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The, the specific slide we showed contained socioeconomic status. They also have another index called Social Vulnerability Index which in addition to the four variables that Heather mentioned, incorporates additional uh, sort of census variables like uh, foreign born population, uh, population whose lang first language is not English, so perhaps they have problems communicating. Um, so I would say there, there could be correlation. There's not a cause and effect there, but it may be helpful to focus on those areas that have um, lower socioeconomic status and to prioritize them because they could be the most vulnerable. Well, thank you very much. And so Claire asked a question via chat, if these maps and data are available for all, all parts of Indiana or any state really, or just major cities. And Jeff, I assume the answer to that is that you could, as you were saying, you can download that data from different data sets, yeah. but you need a GIS person to overlay those different downloads. To That's see. correct. That's correct, Andrea. Um, what I would say is many of the, um, so we, we use data from four sites, FEMA, CDC, USGS, and the Multi-Resolution Land Characteristic Consortium. All of those sites provide data that you can download and analyze. They also provide online viewers, which would allow you to kind of visually look at the data, but it's helpful to have access to um, tools or people or individuals that have sort of analytical skills. In general, I would encourage cities who are sort of lacking access to that to think about local universities um, as potential partners in, in these kinds of projects to bring that expertise. Yeah, and I could certainly see, so the map that Heather showed that had the river with the different buildings and you could see where the flood was going over the building, where the buildings are built. So even just showing a picture of that to the community could really help inspire folks to install green infrastructure or even inspire the local government to try to address some of those issues as we're seeing more and more of these floods come through. So mapping uh, skills are very needed and very useful and can be accessed to universities and even some cities have GIS specialists. Um, so a, a few other questions that came in. Uh, let's see. So this question is from Janet, uh, and it's mostly for Brenda, but could be addressed by uh, Heather and Jeff too. So how successful have you been in getting community members to actively engage in construction oh. of urban green infrastructure? So and and for Brenda, has the Gary have the Gary Green infrastructure efforts resulted in new jobs for community members? Do you have a sense of how many jobs? Yeah. It has, um, so we've established a green infrastructure team. Uh, during the summer, there are 
uh, uh, through our summer youth employment program, we have about, we, we hire about 400 plus uh, youth. They're in high school and college. And we, from that group, we identify about, you know, 30, 40 of them to work on green infrastructure projects only. So learning how to do maintenance uh, that builds their skill set if they're interested in going into the green careers. Um, we, have, we really try to use local contractors to do work for us and do in terms of maintenance. And then uh, one of the things that we are challenged by is having a local landscaper that we can hire to work with residents to do the installations or citizens to do the installation of the green infrastructure. Um, uh, one of the programs that we have, we do not have a problem with community engagement. Actually, the citizens are really excited about uh, this, doing stewardship work. Uh, actually, the Bacon to Vibrant sites that we have out in Aetna, uh, we really don't have to do much maintenance on those sites because the residents were engaged from the beginning of site selection through the planning phases and all the way until we were um, uh, to maintain it long term. So the citizens take care of all of those uh, the, those lots. We just go out and assess them on a, a regular basis to remove weeds or, or maintain or fix something that needs to be done on the site. So Brenda or even Heather or Jeff, have you seen any instances in which community members are deciding as a result of the work going on in the city that community members are deciding to install green infrastructure on in their private residence, whether it be homes or businesses without the city's involvement? Yeah, they are. Oh, that's great. Okay. That's good news. Um, it might even be a focus of another webinar is to talk about how to get community members to, to do that because that can be a strong uh, uh, a difficult thing to achieve. Yeah. Let's see. Um, so, Brenda, uh, we had a question come in from Elizabeth. So she asks, for a highly industrialized and presumably blue-collar city, please elaborate on the city budget prioritization for green infrastructure planning programs. Oh, wow. So that's a great challenge. The good thing is, there are lots of grants out there that we've tapped into. Over a uh, million dollars we receive in green infrastructure grants to do the work. Actually, I have two pending in the progress right now, Buchanan Street, and uh, we're working on the Art House side lot project. So we have, we really re identify funding resources in order to get that done. We also use some of the monies from Gary Stormwater Management District to do some of that installation, uh, stormwater improvement projects. These are uh, larger scale projects though. So we're talking about uh, street, uh, using a complete street concept in areas in Miller we've done so far. And we, are also, we also did one on Bridge Street. Our strategy now is to any road improvements that we do, we incorporate the stormwater stormwater BMPs to manage that stormwater exactly where it is, as opposed to allowing it to go into the combined sewer. Uh, but those are the resources that we use in order to do the work that we're doing. Uh, we know that in the future, because of the investment we have to make into the long-term control plan, green infrastructure is the a product of choice that we will use to do, uh, to manage stormwater or do some of the separation. It won't be the only strategy, but it's a big part of what we will do. So it would be self, it would be funded by the city. Mm -hmm. We are cr creating our own green economy, right? So, uh, we are ready in people for it. It's a good way to go about it. Yeah. So Brenda, you mentioned before that you have a tool that Gary uses to identify and prioritize locations for green infrastructure. So uh, you may have mentioned this before, I apologize, but you, um, that's a tool that was developed by a consultant? Yes. Okay. So the, the GIT, um, uh, so GIT, uh, mm -hmm. we call it the Gary Green Infrastructure Tool. Okay. Um, and 
Do you know it what will. We... It doesn't now. It will. Uh, in in collaboration with some other things. So the way we identify uh, sites where we will do this work is based upon citizen complaints. We know where our, um, based upon some planning efforts that we've done, we've identified some areas where we should focus. The green link is one of those. So that plan was done in 2008. So um, identifying locations is not the, the most challenging. Having, uh, using grant funds and identifying the right location because of its, its public property is the other challenge. Sometimes those, the flood areas are not necessarily the vacant areas. Um, so there's a combination of things that we have to do. The good thing is the Green Link is located near the water body, the Grand Calumet River, the Little Calumet River. So we can use that riparian areas uh, so that we can do some stormwater runoff prevention, um, planting trees. I didn't even talk about the tree program we have uh, and other stuff like that. So other uh, activities similar to that. So our post priority areas uh, where we will install stormwater uh, best management practices are uh, have been identified. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to all of our presenters, to Brenda, to Heather, and to all the support you provided today, Jeff, uh, and to everybody that was able to attend today. This was a very successful webinar, and we look forward to having many more in the future. Uh, so thank you for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you guys again in a month. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care.